Hey guys, Michael Corsentino with the companion video for my October lighting column in Shutter Magazine, your number one destination for all things photography education. Go out and get it. If you're not subscribing, you should be. It's awesome. You can read the digital edition or you can pick it up at Barnes and Noble. So this month we're talking all about photographing male portraits, about lighting male portraits specifically. Um, so uh, there are some different things that I think about uh, when I'm photographing a male versus photographing a woman. Um, and I talk about this in the article. Uh, so you'll definitely want to reference the article as well. Uh, but basically, uh, when I'm photographing males, I think, um, and this is not, there are no hard and fast rules. There are a lot of women, um, you know, who are very powerful and strong and who can um, withstand, based on their bone structure and perhaps the context which in with you're photographing them, very hard light, very, very dramatic and strong lighting. Um, like, so for example, for example, Helmut Newton's, uh, the w women that he photographed. Um, but more often than not, women are going to, uh, you know, I'm going to photograph them with a softer, more pleasing light. And men, I have a lot more latitude in terms of maybe a harder, uh, kind of more contrasty, more punchy kind of light. And, you know, those considerations are going to dictate the tools that I choose and the techniques that I'm going to use to light uh, each of the subjects differently. Um, and we've talked about that a lot in previous articles. So definitely reference uh, prior articles and videos as well. But uh, as you know, you know uh, the, the look that you're going for is going to dictate uh, the tools and techniques that you're going to use. And we're going to dig into that in this video. Um, so here you can see uh, one of the final shots. Uh, and this was um, the brief for this was to photograph an up and coming actor and model. Uh, so uh, you know that sort of dictated the look that I wanted to create for him. Uh, I wanted to create a really uh, a modern version of kind of a stylized Hollywood portrait, the classic iconic Hollywood portraits. And I wanted to create uh, a lighting pattern um, that was going to really accentuate uh, his bone structure uh, and that was going to create drama um, and that was going to give a real kind of dimensional sculptural look. Uh, to his face and to the lighting, which was going to add drama. Um, and I wanted to also, uh, I had a, a, the original uh, concept for the portrait was black and white because it was sort of hearkening back to that, those early Hollywood portraits, those very classic portraits. Uh, but I also wanted to give it a modern bent and I wanted to uh, try some colored gels and add in a little bit more of a contemporary kind of look. So that's what this uh, came to with. Uh, so, you know, you always want to have an idea. And I think it's really great to have a plan um, when you're going into something, but then to be uh, okay to deviate from that plan and let kind of the magic happen, you know, let those spontaneous things uh, take you because oftentimes you have a plan and then you end up, you know, getting, uh, finding a different way, you know, a different path during the shoot and you end up with something much better than you ever planned. But you always have to have a plan, at least I think I always recommend having a plan because, uh, you know, it's going to dictate what kind of gear you're going to have on set and it's going to dictate where you're going to start uh, and, you know, where you uh, are planning on ending up and then anything else that you have is gravy. Uh, at the very least, you know, you'll be able to accomplish what you set out to so you're not kind of flying blind. So I think that's important. So let's take a look at how this shoot progressed. All right. So here is our first lighting setup, and that's the same lighting setup that we that we used in that uh, in the color gel shot. Uh, but we just swapped in some color gels, and I'll talk specifically about my gel technique because it's it's a um, a little bit different from uh, what you may be doing. Um, okay. So this is basically like a cross light setup that I have going on here with some modifications, uh, and I'm, I've got some BTS uh, shots as well, which will give you a much better idea of height and position for the lights. But this overhead kind of gives you a good idea of where they are uh, before we look at the BTS. So you can see here that it's cross light, that both lights are facing one another, um, but the angle of the lights here is really going to play a, a very important role uh, and the way that the tools uh, are modified. So for example, uh, each of these are strip boxes. They're Ellen Chrome 14 by 35 Rotolux uh, strip boxes. They call them soft boxes, but uh, if you're looking for them uh, on B&H, for example, you'll look for soft boxes, not strip boxes, but everybody else calls them strip boxes. So that's kind of how I refer to them. Um, and they've got 30 degree grids. Now the grids that I use are light tools grids. Uh, they have an easy pop, uh, they, what they call an easy pop uh, frame system. It's an internal collapsible frame and when you expand it, it keeps the grid rigid uh, so that the cell structure um, uh, is the way that it should be and it allows the light to pass through it, uh, 
unimpeded and in the way that's going to give you the best quality of light. Uh, they're a little more expensive, uh, I'm not going to lie, uh, but for, uh, I think they're worth it uh, and uh, I would recommend them. And un unfortunately, uh, or, or fortunately, they are the, uh, the only grids available uh, across the entire Ellen Chrome line. So if you are, uh, you know, partial to Ellen Chrome uh, softboxes like I am, uh, light tools is, you know, is, is the, what you're going to want to use for grids. And, you know, these grids are going to last you forever. So, uh, you know, it's the kind of the buy it once, use it forever mentality. Um, so that's what I have to say about that. So 30 degree uh, grids on the on each of these softboxes. Um, and I've also taken off the internal baffle. Now, so e each softbox has all various ways that you can modify it, right? So you can use it with the internal, you've got an internal baffle, uh, which diffuses the light, and you've got an external diffusion panel. They both essentially do the same thing. They both diffuse the light and broaden the light. So so each one is giving you an additional layer uh, of that effect, of that softening and broadening effect. So and softening the hot spots, etc., that come from the from the uh, from the strobe inside the softbox. So you can remove one or both in order to accentuate, uh, you know, a more contrasty, a more punchy look. So in this case, I've taken out the internal baffle because I wanted, after testing and after taking a couple shots and seeing that I wasn't getting quite that punchy look that I really wanted, I removed that internal baffle and that gave me kind of that found the sweet spot, the middle spot that I wanted, and gave me the right look. Now I could have, of course, removed the uh, front diffusion panel as well, uh, but that would have been too much. So it's all about finding that right sort of sweet spot. Um, so basically, you know, this light uh, back here, uh, I'm using here, and that's lighting up this side of the face. And then this one over here, camera left, is lighting up this side of the face. So I'm basically dividing the side, the, both sides of the face in two, bisecting the face with the light, and that's creating this really cool, dramatic look, right? It's very simple, uh, but it does take a bit of time and a bit of noodling to get it right, like sp especially this light. And that's why I, I prefer working one light at a time and dialing these in one at a time, keeping each light off, turning on only one light at a time, and then you know dialing them in as you go. And you can work with modeling lights. Uh, if you're not using gels, if you are using gels, you're not gonna wanna use modeling lights. In this case, this was before we put the gels on, so I was using the modeling lights to see where uh, my light was falling. Uh, but working one light at a time makes it much easier when you're working with very precise kind of lights. Like I want, I didn't want, uh, you know, this light to come any further than here. So, you know, having two lights on at the same time makes it really difficult to tell what's going on um, with one light uh, versus the other. So just turning off the, this light on this side made it much easier to see what was happening here. Okay, so let's take a look at our second light source. This is exactly the same thing. We used exactly the same uh, lighting setup for this one. Here, all that we did was we added in uh, gels on either, uh, on either side. We added a, a blue gel over on the uh, camera left side and a red gel on the camera right side. Um, and that cut a stop of light. So I had to open up a stop from F16 to F11. So that's something to bear in mind that, you know, gels will reduce the amount of light passing through uh, because they're, you know, they have a certain amount of opacity to them. Um, all right, so let's see what we've got. Next is our BTS. Okay, so, you know, uh, diagrams are great, but, you know, uh, behind the scenes, and I usually have a grid, uh, um, rather a, um, uh, a gear slides, but we don't need that because now I can I can go over all the gear. I know everybody likes to hear about the gear, uh, so we'll use this BTS slide to talk about that and also to give you a better idea of exactly what the light uh, position and angle is. You can see here uh, exactly what angle and heights were used to create this look that we see over here. Okay, so again, we've got two 500 watt second heads, in this case Profoto B1 battery operated strobes. You can see here I've got pocket wizards here. Uh, using Kupo stands, Kupo uh, C stands, uh, and a rolling stand. I just you know use whatever I had on hand. Uh, uh, in the stand department, I am also using this Manfrotto uh, rolling studio stand, uh, and I find this really really helpful, uh, especially shooting medium format. You can see I've got my Phase One uh, with a two, um, IQ 250 digital back, again pocket wizard to trigger. Um, and you know it's a kind of a heavy camera, so uh, the studio stand is really helpful, and it allows you to have consistency uh, with your portraits because if you're shooting handheld, um, you know all of a sudden you know you look at the overall shots and things are kind of moving around and maybe they're not exactly uh, consistent uh, in terms of positioning. So it's helpful. I find it helpful. Um, 
and uh, I like it better than a tripod because it's you know it's on wheels and I can move it around and it's got various uh, points of um, uh, you know I can that I can change the angle and you know uh, uh, rotation and all that stuff so I've got lots of different points of adjustment on this you can see them here and here and I'm using it with a Manfrotto three-way head so I've got even more points of articulation that was the word I was looking for articulation all right so back to the lights so we've got our Rotolux soft boxes here they're strip boxes 14 by 35 and light tools 30 inch uh, 30 degree grid spots on the front and that is confining the light to a really small pool of light right and that's what this whole look is all about it's just very very small pools of light you can see them here right just very small areas they're you know they're really kind of locked in uh, to you know kind of a vertical strip of light um, and that's exactly the look that I wanted and again so I need to use the tools that are going to get me there right uh, and you can see here the height and position of everything and kind of the angle uh, this angle is more extreme on this one than this one needed to be. This is much more kind of a flat. There's a little bit of a pitch to it, but not much. Um, and then I'm using this Lastolite uh, reflector panel with black fabric on it. And you can use this to remove shadow, uh, which I oftentimes do. But sometimes I'll use it uh, as a background. So it's great uh, you know, to be able to use one tool to do a multitude of things. Uh, you can see here uh, my... Apple Box. I'm a huge fan of Apple Boxes. I always have them with me either in the studio or on location. So I recommend Apple Boxes. Um, and inside here, I've got the internal baffle removed, okay, from each one of these. Now, the external baffle is still, or diffusion panel is still there. So it's providing some level of softness. Um, but it's been, uh, the internal one is removed because I wanted more of that specular kind of punchy look. And I'll just turn this off for a minute so you can see. You can see here uh, on, the, on the face, on the right and left side, that I've got kind of a specular, contrasty, punchy look. And that is a function of removing that interior baffle. And if you wanted even more of that, contrast of that punch then you would just remove the exterior baffle as well and you could still of course keep the egg crate grids on there the soft uh, light tools grids uh, and that would confine the light whatever the quality was it would confine it to that vertical strip of light for you and keep it where you wanted okay let's move on to our second setup and this was a flat light setup now the cool thing about this is i knew that i would be able to use exactly the same tools that i had on set for the first look, for the dimensional light look, for this second flat light look. Uh, and that I wouldn't have to, I could quickly progress to this um, because, you know, your onset time is money and, you know, you don't want people waiting around. Uh, but I wanted to create a variety of shots. I think it's it's great to do that. I, I like to shoot, you know, kind of thinking in terms of layouts and thinking editorially. And so I, I like to have a, a range of images and a range of lighting styles that will pair well together um, so that you've got some that are very dramatic, perhaps, and some that are, you know, more flat lit like this one. Um, and you'll see, I'm going to show you some layouts later on. And I, th I think it worked out really nicely. But I don't want to be fussing with all sorts of new tools and new setups uh, because it just takes too much time. So if if I can work with the tools that I have on set already, uh, great, I'll do that. And that's, you know, that's what happened in this case. So you can see here that I've just taken the, uh, each of the strip boxes, I've removed the grids that were on the front, you don't see those any longer, and I've just put them side to side from the camera, and the di this diagram is a little off, you'll see in the behind the scenes what, what's really a more accurate representation, but uh, shooting through them and like that it's super simple uh, and it creates a really cool kind of look and of course I did some you know I added a little contrast in post um, and uh, you'll see so I will cover some of the posts on the portrait later on in this presentation um, but there you go simple you know nice punchy black and white portrait uh, more three-quarter and also you know when I talked about shooting in terms of layouts and variety uh, posing and uh, how tight or how loose you shoot and shooting a variety you know shooting really tight portraits and then shooting some three-quarter length and maybe full at length and perhaps some detail shots there's, there's just a ton of things that you can do the more variety that you have the better you know layouts you're able to build and I'll, I'll show you that later all right let's take a look at our behind the scenes for this so here you can see exactly what I was talking about uh, the lights are a little bit closer than the diagram uh, would lead you to believe so I've got them pretty much side to side as you can see here and here uh, and the camera is here right uh, and they're just pointing right at Caleb uh, and uh, they're providing they're creating this cool look right flat look very shadowless look um, 
kind of cool catch lights, got two vertical catch lights, one on either side of the eye. Um, I like this look. I'm fond of it, and I think it worked for this application. So let's move on and talk more about working one light at a time. Okay, so we talked about this a little bit earlier. So here you're gonna see it in practice. So you'll see how I was able to dial in one light at a time and how it made it much easier to see exactly what was going on uh, with each light and to see what light was being contributed by each light, yeah? So here on the right, we can see what's happening from our camera right light. So I'm rhyming, I'm a poet and I don't even know it. Um, and then over here on the left, you can see our camera left light, what's happening there. So again, you know, I can't say enough times and how much benefit you get from working one light at a time. It's really gonna make it much easier to see what's going on because like for example, uh, here I'm seeing exactly where this light is ending, right? And that was really important for this. Uh, I've got just a little bit of light here on the nose and that was acceptable. Um, but I got I, I really know what's happening with this light. Uh, whereas if I have both of these lights on, it becomes very difficult to judge what's happening uh, with my right, uh, with the right light and, and the same thing with the left light. I, I can't tell, you know, where one ends and where the other begins. So that's really what this was all about. So definitely, you know, sometimes working uh, with one light at a time is the way to go. And this was one of those cases. All right, let's talk about the gels. So for our red gel, I used a Roscoe 26, and for the blue, it was 375, and this ended up looking kind of more teal. And gels are tricky that way. You really have to sort of try them and see what you're getting and see what kind of intensity is coming out of them uh, based on the power of the lighting that you're using and how much power you're putting out of the lights and how much uh, power they're cutting from the lights and all those things. Like I say, it went down my lighting, uh, uh, you know, it reduced the, I was, and granted I was only using 500 watt second uh, heads for this, but I, I did have to uh, open up my aperture from f16 to f11, and that was okay. I, I actually kind of liked the look that I got, and so that was fine. Um, I use these Roscoe lighting kits, and they are 12 by 12 kits. They're a great value. They come with a ton of different gels. Uh, and there's a whole range of uh, different packs in these kits. But the one thing is they are 12 by 12. Now you can get gels in big rolls, uh, but then you have to buy one at a time and it can end up you know, being costly and you don't really know what, which one you might wanna use for which particular application. So it kind of can be creatively a little limiting, uh, but when you have a whole range of, you know, I have like 10 of these packs of all different gels. So it gives you a lot of creative freedom, uh, but then you don't have enough gel to cover in the entire front of a, of a soft box. So my workaround for that, what I call my ghetto gel technique, is what I'm going to show you. But first I want to show you what the effect is. For example, if I had the, a roll of gel and I was able to cover the entire front of the soft box, this is what it would look like, okay? Because here I'm covering the, inter the entire strobe inside the soft box. So you can see that here, right? Strobes completely covered. Okay, so here you can see what effect that gives. And for my money, this is too much. It's too much gel. It's too intrusive. It's like, hey, I'm a gel, and I don't want that. Like, I want something that looks like maybe it could be photographed um, in real life. Like, this guy was out uh, in front of a bar or a neon sign or something, you know, that was more moody and more evocative than more intrusive and more like, hey, screaming, this was lit with gels. So I like to have a little bit of white light added in from the strobe uh, into the mix so that it's, it's a more subtle effect. Subtlety is the word I'm looking for. So my ghetto gel technique, since I don't work with rolls, which I could kind of put on half of, of the stroke, you know, half the fr front face of the softbox, is to do this. I just kind of use the gaff tape and I move the gel down and tape it kind of to the side of the box so that some of the white light is allowed to escape outside behind the gel and spill onto the, you know, into the picture, right? So here you can see a much more subtle effect, right? Let's turn, let's give you the, uh, oh, I have a before and after for you, okay. So you can see how it's giving you a much more kind of subtle effect for each side of the face, right? The blue has got a lot more white in it and the red has a lot more white in it. And for my money, you know, for my taste, it's a much more pleasing, more natural looking effect. So here is our before and after, right? So you can see uh, with full gel, and then with partial gel and white light showing through. So, you know, that's my taste. I prefer that. You may like this look, and that's fine. Uh, and I, it might be the right look for certain applications. But for this, uh, for this particular portrait and this subject, uh, this was more on the money for me. 
All right, let's march forward. Okay, so here I just always like to include a, a little snapshot of my workspace so you can see my uh, uh, contact sheet in Capture One. Uh, so this gives you kind of an, a snapshot of the overall progression for the shoot. You can see it took me a, a, a minute to get dialed in. Uh, if we're looking over here, you can see that, you know, it takes time and these things don't just happen instantly. All right, but that's one of the reasons why I work, uh, I like working with a light meter because I know at the, at the very least, like the minute I make my first exposure, <clears throat> it's going to be a perfect exposure and it may not be the exposure that I end up using, but it's going to be a perfect exposure. So, you know, uh, it makes my clients and my subjects, you know, and my uh, everybody on set more confident because the minute that that shutter clicks the first time, it's the right thing. So they know that they're, you know, they're working with a professional and someone who knows what they're doing. And then if I need extra time to dial it in and find just the perfect look, they're okay. They're comfortable kind of hanging back. Uh, oftentimes I do that with an assistant and I have them step in. In this case, uh, I did not have that. So here you can see how I kind of had to work to find just the right look and I kind of start to get it dialed in down here. You can see here that now I'm kind of really kind of finessing it using that one light at a time technique that I showed you before. Uh, and uh, also got it here. I had to kind of just check myself and make sure that I was getting what I wanted. But here you can see some of the finals down here. And then of course we switch to our second look. All right. So I wanted to walk you through some of the post steps. Okay. So here you can see <clears throat> this is uh, what it looked like captured with uh, just the color version. I did shoot everything so that it would appear uh, as I shot it uh, tethered, I shot tethered, so that it would appear tethered uh, in black and white. On my laptop in Capture One Pro, you can do that. You can set it up so as you're shooting, and the same thing with Lightroom, uh, that it immediately converts it as it brings it into black and white. So here is what it looked like when I was shooting it. Uh, then I made some adjustments while shooting uh, to bring in a little more, more contrast uh, and to kind of pump up the highlights a little bit. Uh, and then here you can see what I did in uh, Capture One with uh, color grading um, and sharpening. Uh, and then I brought it into Photoshop and did the final retouch. But all of this right here, all of this workflow zoop, is all Capture One Pro 9, okay? So that's everything. Really powerful software, and I, I love it. Uh, so if you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's awesome stuff. And here are our finals. <clears throat> so you can see here the range of stuff that we're able to do in a pretty quick time period. Uh, we've got the uh, first one, which is kind of what I had in mind when I started this out, when I envisioned this originally, uh, the black and white version. Then we've changed it up and gave it a more kind of contemporary modern twist by adding some colored gels. And then I switched very quickly to the flat-like look. So we've got the dimensional, really contrasty, really uh, sculptural, dramatic look, and then um, kind of the more um, flat-light editorial kind of look going on uh, on the right. Okay. Uh, so again, I talked about spreads and why I like to shoot this way. And so I wanted to show you some of the spreads that I put together to kind of make that point a little clearer. So here we go. So here you can see the difference that cropping really makes. Uh, and you know, you, 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 it's a good thing to shoot. And it's something that I had to learn. It was to, to be able to be comfortable shooting more wider um, because it gives you more options. Uh, I like to get everything right in camera and I'm sort of, but, but, you know, shooting a little bit more, a little wider gives you more options uh, later on uh, for cropping in. Um, so I'm comfortable now with being okay with cropping. And this is the difference that you get with cropping. Like you can see that portrait on the, the right, how much more powerful it is uh, cropped in tighter. Um, so it gives me that flexibility to do that uh, l later on after the fact. But if I need more room, if I need more space, I have it. Uh, or if my client in a magazine, whatever needs more room, they have it. Um, but it, but they, we can also, if, if it's a layout, you know, crop in like this and create something very, very dramatic. And you can see here that now, you know, that tight portrait and the three quarter, how well they pair together, right? Let's just take a look at the overall. So you can see here the out of camera, full frame, right? Full compositions. Uh, and they're cool, they're good, but all of a sudden for, for me, I mean, this is that crop is way more dramatic. Um, and I'm really happy with the way that that looks. All right, let's take a look at the color version. And there we go, color version, okay? And again, full frame and the cropped version, right? So uh, for me, it's pretty evident that that works a lot better and just looks really powerful. 
Uh, and, you know, mission accomplished. Like, I, he was very happy, and I think uh, we got what we came for, and we gave him some very powerful, very dramatic, uh, you know, images that really showed off his, uh, you know, his strength and his face, uh, the bone structure, uh, and, you know, his kind of iconic looks. Definitely got a Hollywood look going there, and um, we had fun, and you know, more importantly. So, and, and everybody was happy. So, there we go. Uh, that is going to, here's a nice close-up uh, showing all the detail and everything. So, that's going to wrap it up for this month, guys. I had fun, and I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, until next month, this has been Michael Corsentino for Shutter Magazine, and I will see you next time.